Should you buy a stout set of alloy wheels or should you spend the extra money and get some carbon? As many of you have noticed, I swap back and forth pretty often between the two. So in this video, I'm gonna tell the story of why I ride both to this day. Furthermore, this will be a nice way to give a shout out to my wheel sponsor, Industry 9. Now, I'm not trying to sell you an Industry 9 product in any way in this video. I just wanna explain what my perspective is and why I happen to ride both types of wheels and will continue to ride both types. This video is proudly sponsored by my friends over at Jensen USA. And I have a link in the YouTube description below over to the wheel department at Jensen. Anything you purchase from Jensen will help keep these videos coming your way, so thanks in advance. Furthermore, I'm also supported by PNW Components and Shimano. Okay, let's get into the story. When I was a kid riding BMX and mountain bikes in the 1990s, wheels were generally, in my experience, a disaster. Being a spazoid little BMX kid, whenever I tried to ride a mountain bike like how I wanted to, the wheels would pretty quickly tell me that they didn't like that. With a BMX background, I was used to 48 spokes, 14 millimeter axles, and wait, who cares? The mid 1990s were also a formative time in mountain biking and carbon wheels were readily available. Why? Well, road biking. Road biking is kind of like the older sister to mountain biking. The older sister who happens to be 21, who hangs out with rock stars, who drives a European car. Us mountain bikers, we still had some growing to do, at least back then. We were stuck with road biking's quirky little hand-me-downs, like those squirrely little quick releases, the narrow rim widths, the high tire pressures. Generally, we were stuck with the whole idea that bicycles were for going places instead of for having fun on and going over places. Speaking of road bikes, the demands of a road bike wheel are totally different than a mountain bike. So carbon wheels really began popularity because not because they were lighter, not because they rode better, but because they were more aerodynamic. Steve Head created the first carbon fiber wheels, and he used some aerospace technology to get that better aerodynamic advantage. It's not about strength, it's not about ride quality, it's not about weight, it's just about get cutting through the wind faster. Now on a road bike, you're going a lot faster than you are on a rocky, dry, dusty, convoluted mountain bike ride. One rainy day in late 2010, my friend Eric Highlander, who also happens to be the namesake of the Santa Cruz High Tower, had taken a sabbatical from his position at Santa Cruz Bikes and had gone over to Easton, which used to make mountain bike parts. Sure enough, he had a set of prototype EC70 carbon wheels he offered to let me ride in exchange for a little feedback. And you know me, good parts for free for just a little feedback, I'm for sure on board. I was already kind of familiar with Easton carbon wheels because we were specking the EC90 wheels on the Mojo SLR and on some of those first Ripley prototypes. The EC70s that I got were a 26 inch diameter and I threw them on the scale at Ibis. You know what they weighed? 1,270 grams. That's nothing. I don't like to put myself within boundaries and say, I won't ride whatever thing because of whichever idealistic reason. I tried the EC70s, very genuinely, honestly tried them. And I really liked those things. They were so incredibly light. I was running specialized control casing tires, which are also super light. And with these carbon 19 millimeter wide rims, I was running in the high 30s for tire pressure. That sounds ridiculous. And remember, this is like 2011 or whatever. And I had to limit myself to only ride those wheels on my Mojo SLR and then on my Mojo HD 140. So both those bikes used a Fox 32 mil stanchion fork. Today, a 32 mil stanchion fork is kind of like, oh, really, you really want to ride that on your cross country bike? Back then, that was like kind of a normal fork. Now, I limited myself to the smaller bikes of 140 travel and 50 travel because I knew if I started sending these wheels with my big 160 setup, I would probably destroy them. And they were so light and still reasonably stiff, it was kind of eye-opening as to what was possible. Now, as what usually happens for me, spokes started breaking, and then I took the wheels back for a rebuild, and sure enough, there were tons of cracks in them, so I had gotten a decent amount of time out of those things, enough to take carbon rims seriously. At Ibis, I learned about a brand called Derby. Ray Scruggs, a big supporter of Ibis bikes, had begun importing super wide carbon rims under the Derby name. These were available in 27.5, right at the mountain bike world's awakening to the existence of this third wheel size. And the wider rim was great for the traditional upright riding style of many riders. However, tire choices were very limited. This is when I first started to ride modern WTB tires. The profile of the original Vigilante worked awesome on these super wide rims. I refused to run the 16 to 17 PSI of other test riders, citing many angry rock gardens. These tires are an important part of why I'm okay with carbon rims today. The two layers of thick 60 TPI casing on the tough tires, called Team Issue back in the day, were the first tires I'd ever ridden that could survive a low 20 pressure while being ridden aggressively in rocky conditions. Now I had some carbon wheels which were stiff and super wide. 
I thought this was key to racing success because, well, I was on carbon rims for years and have been doing pretty darn well. Unfortunately, race courses stayed pretty mellow in this time, so I was riding my Ripley in more and more events. The stiffness advantage on the 29-inch platform was pretty big. It actually made the Ripley feel a lot more capable for the enduro events. But with only 120 millimeters of travel, my bike of choice would generally continue to be the 27.5 Mojo HD3. At the Whistler EWS race in 2015, I had the best stage finish of my career with the 29th and a few more finishes in the 30s. But then my rear rim broke and I DNF. Realizing that a dented rim will usually still hold air pressure and will certainly still roll, I converted most of my bikes over to metal rims. I started to ride Industry 9 aluminum rims in 2019 and the stiffness was fantastic, very close to the carbon rims I had used previously. Over the years, there have been advancements in the aluminum rim technology and weight was now within a couple ounces as the carbon units. Industry 9 suggested I try some carbon rims, but being somewhat reformed at this point, riding only flat pedals, no longer racing, and not caring at all about weight, I thought carbon wheels were kind of pointless. But like I mentioned earlier, I don't ruminate on idealism, so I decided to go ahead and try these carbon wheels. The difference? Subtle. More subtle on the 27.5, but on the 29er, I would equate it to a similar feel as going from an aluminum frame all the way over to a carbon. Between my various bikes, I noticed I would slightly prefer the carbon rim. It was torsionally stiffer. Now that I was riding burly tires at all times, I wasn't worried about hitting a rim on a rock. And the extra stiffness of the rims helped make anything firmly or jumpy feel a lot more predictable. My riding style of leaning the bike over a lot in corners has really meshed well with modern geometry. This means that I don't necessarily need to use those super wide rims anymore, so having an inner rim width around 30 millimeters has been a pretty good setup. Here in 2021, honestly, these carbon rims have held up beautifully. I'm pretty aware that I could totally break one, but out of all the various wheel sets I'm riding, none of the carbon wheels have had any spokes loosen up. The aluminum rims and wheels have been great, but I do need to throw them in the trimming stand every few months. Aluminum rims are very difficult to consistently produce within tubeless spec without having a hook. As a result, the vast majority of aluminum rims have bead hooks. Carbon rims are able to be made much more consistently, and as a result, they don't require bead hooks. So this means the tire is much less likely to suffer damage at that hard to repair spot between the bead and the sidewall. So in a very circuitous story, while carbon came from road bike aerodynamics, then morphed into lightweight, it only recently found its real home, ride quality and lower maintenance. Is it for everyone? I can't answer that, but I'll certainly keep riding both. Thanks for joining me on my story of why I'm riding both carbon and aluminum rims. If you enjoyed this video, please do hit that subscribe button below. Leave me a friendly note in the comment if you like this little different storytelling format. I do have a link to the Jensen USA wheel department in the YouTube description below, and anything you purchase at Jensen will directly help support my channel. Furthermore, I couldn't be doing these videos without all of you watching, so thank you for your attention. Peace.